This is Peggy Peck reporting from Orlando at the 2008 Gastrointestinal Cancer Symposium. Five-year survival for people with gastrointestinal stromal tumors now stands at 52 percent, a remarkable rate of survival considering that just a decade ago there was in fact no treatment for this cancer. That changed in 2001 when the then investigational drug imitinib, Gleevec, showed promise for this very difficult cancer. Here, Dr. Robert Mackey discuss, discusses the current state of the art in treatment of GIST and proposes what we might be expecting to see in the next 18 months. When we look at GIST and we look at the, the data from the imatinib studies, the results are, are just are so impressive. The results are so good. And, and they appear to be good at, at either a, a low dose of 400 milligrams or a high dose of 600 milligrams or even daily dose, dosing versus every other day dosing. So uh, what does that tell us? I mean, why not just stay with a very low dose of the drug? Well, that, that, that really is what's done uh, as a standard of practice for um, people with metastatic gist. The drug was approved at a dose of 400 milligrams daily, and people really do adhere to that. Um, we think that there may be a subset of people, though, who may benefit from a higher dose, a higher starting dose. Those are the people with um, exon 9 mutations in their CKIT molecule in their gist. Uh, in that situation, there are some data from Europe from the large randomized phase three study that showed that people with an exon 9 mutation fared better if they were on an 800 milligram total dose daily of imatinib in comparison to the 400 milligram dose. Now, practically speaking, it's, uh, the mutation analysis is still not a standard of care. It can be done um, as a laboratory test or it can be done as a you know, commercial request. Uh, but since uh, only 10 or 15 percent of people are affected by this less frequent mutation, we generally start everyone at 400 milligrams daily and simply dose escalate to the higher dose uh, when there's evidence of progression. Why is that problematic or do you think it would be better to, to have the, the identification at baseline so you could start, you could initiate at a higher dose? Uh, that, that, that's the thought is that uh, the higher dose may be better um, if you can start it earlier for those people with those exon 9 mutant uh, gists. Uh, that being said, it's harder to start at 800 milligrams yeah. versus 400 and there's maybe better anyway to just ramp up people from 400 to 600 to 800 milligrams. Uh, for some reason it uh, gets the um, uh, metabolic processes of the body going and there seem to be fewer side effects if you transition from a lower dose to a higher dose than just starting mm -hmm. um, overtly at that higher dose. Now we're looking at, at pharmacokinetic studies to determine at what the actual level of the drug is in, in the blood and we, had, we heard some data reported here at the, um, at the GI symposium on that. Um, but I'm wondering what is the next step in your opinion? Where, where are we going from here? It's uh, probably a multi-branch type of question. We're certainly looking for better tyrosine kinase inhibitors that may have more efficacy against CKIT. Um, and we're also looking for other members of that pathway further downstream, the signaling pathway from the CKIT molecule, to see if any a blocking of uh, any of those molecules may be uh, important as well, because what's happening now is we're seeing multifocal resistance. In other words, there are several clones of uh, GIST which are developing in the resistant patients, and each one of those clones has a separate uh, secondary CKIT mutation or another reason uh, for which the tumor is now resistant. So as a result, you can no longer just target one uh, tyrosine kinase or mutation. Um, there seems to be some proclivity for uh, one of the tyrosine, uh, pardon me, for the um, uh, one mutation being more sensitive uh, in terms of the, uh, any of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors than another one. Uh, we're seeing some data from that both in terms of exon 9 and exon 11 for imatinib and sunitinib. Mm -hmm. That probably applies for the other tyrosine kinases that have some activity as well. The uh, other IBs, uh, mm -hmm. be they serafinib and ilotinib, um, and now the um, monetinib I think is the, the newest one, AMG 706. Mm -hmm. Um, now, that, that being said, um, that's not going to be the only way to move forward, and it looks like the, uh, one of the approaches that is having some usefulness is to try and attack all of those CKIT molecules, not just block the CKIT kinase function. And a couple of new compounds just in early phase one studies or in translational research studies show evidence that they can degrade the actual CKIT molecule or, or decrease its production or the net amount that is in the cell, and by doing that, shutting off the same survival signal that's being sent through CKIT to, uh, to the uh, just tumor cell. And by that means, um, achieving some sort of benefit that was no longer seen when people became resistant, uh, highly resistant to the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Mm -hmm. So those sorts of approaches are the, the ones that we'll see next, most likely. What are those compounds, those, those pipeline compounds that you're referencing? 
So those are most of the HSP90 inhibitors. Uh, the one that's most advanced is the IPI504 compound, which uh, George Dimitri has uh, worked on in a phase one study and then moving on to phase two studies, and I believe they've been a phase three study. Uh, the class of HSP90 inhibitors looks interesting um, as a, a follow-up approach to tyrosine well, really, kinase. We're just mainly at this point phase one, phase two, and those in those compounds, um, and so it will be a, it will be a while before we'll be seeing some. Exactly. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So on the short term, on the short term, if you were to say you're speaking now to to one of your colleagues and you say this is what we know now, and this is this is I would predict what, the way things are going to play out over the course of say the next 18 months or so. What would be your prediction then? Yeah, well, there may be uh, these newer tyrosine kinases that are the most available thing in terms of uh, phase two and or phase three studies. Um, the um, uh, nilotinib, for example, is going to be examined in a combination with um, imatinib in, in a larger number of patients. We'll see if there's any usefulness for that approach as opposed to just sticking with the imatinib alone. Uh, one thing that is important to point out is that even in people who are resistant to the tyrosine kinases as inhibitors as best as you can determine by scan, it's important to maintain them on some sort of tyrosine kinase inhibitor simply because when you stop the medication, the symptoms seem to accelerate. Mm -hmm. So even though the tumors are progressing, they would progress even more rapidly if they are off the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. In the short term then, the strategy that's emerging appears to be a combination of tyrosine kinase inhibitors at the same time that you're tracking blood levels of the drugs. Is that correct? Absolutely. So, and that applies not only to imatinib, but the other tyrosine kinase inhibitors as well. Uh, we performed a, uh, a study of serafinib, for example, in uh, patients with soft tissue sarcoma, and we had twice as many women as men in that study in comparison to the registration studies for serafinib, which had twice as many men as women. And we had to reduce the dose for about two-thirds of patients um, on our study because of uh, side effects from the compound. So uh, one size fits all clearly isn't the uh, right approach for uh, for these inhibitors and it will take some of this uh, working out of uh, drug levels and uh, trying to determine what the appropriate dose is for the appropriate patient both at the outset uh, as well as in monitoring. Um, in the uh, presentation today you mentioned that going forward we may be looking at these drugs more as hormonal therapy than as, than as chemotherapy and I wonder if you could just expand on that. I'd be more than happy to, absolutely. So um, this reflects uh, some of the data that were collected by the American College of Surgeons Oncology Group uh, ACASOG with their Z9000 and Z9001 studies. The uh, Z9001 study was discussed at ASCO already in 2007, and that showed that there was a progression-free survival advantage um, to giving imatinib for a year. Uh, in other words, if you looked at one year just at the end of therapy, uh, only 3% of people had progressed on imatinib, whereas people on placebo um, about 17 percent of those people had progressed. However, when those people were crossed over to drug, uh, they had good results because we've only seen, uh, with a median follow-up with only 15 months, seven people die out of about 650 who were registered on study. So um, it's pretty clear that imatinib is very effective in the salvage setting as well, and that's been the argument from uh, the European side saying, why are you giving adjuvant therapy at all? Because uh, you know that you can salvage most people even if you do see that they recur. Um, but we do know that metastatic disease usually is fatal disease. Um, the median time to progression for people with metastatic disease on imatinib is about two years. So it's uh, certainly not a panacea. There are, are certainly people who are still on imatinib after five or six years now uh, doing quite well, um, but uh, they're clearly in the minority. So do we try and push harder in the adjuvant setting? Uh, and give longer courses of therapy? Uh, does, does it look like uh, um, imatinib and its kin are more like standard chemotherapy where usually six months of therapy is adequate to achieve the adjuvant benefit? Uh, it's pretty clear from the Z9001 data that there is some benefit in terms of progression-free survival on imatinib, but that goes away over time, although again the follow-up is short. So um, it's fairly clear to us that a longer exposure to drug is necessary and that immediately brings to thought um, what's happened with hormonal therapy for breast cancer over the years where you know three, five, ten years of therapy is superior to the shorter amount of time. And that may be the direction uh, that the research goes next for um, adjuvant therapy for, uh, for GIST. 
but uh, um, that, that's still in discussions right now. Do you, do you foresee that it could possibly just be a chronic therapy? That's what we see when it's in terms of using it in the, in the setting of leukemia. Yes, that, that's certainly the case. The one issue there is um, if people have a resected gist, they're not guaranteed a recurrence. Um, even high-risk gists, uh, there is a fraction of those people who will not have a recurrence of disease. So we'd be treating some fraction of people who have no evidence of cancer in their body indefinitely, and that's a little bit hard to argue to do. What we've tried to uh, uh, suggest, at least, uh, if you are going to give adjuvant therapy for gastrointestinal stromal tumors, you try and find those people with high-risk features, those who have a high mitotic rate, have a, a tumor that arose from the small bowel and is fairly large. Those people have a very high risk of recurrence of disease later, probably in excess of 80 percent, and you could argue to give um, some course of therapy, which is still is undefined. We hope to have a little bit more data from Europe as well, where they are performing studies of no imatinib versus two years, and a separate study of one year of imatinib versus three years, and that will help us answer to some degree the duration question as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you very much. You've been very helpful, Doctor. You're very welcome. Thanks for a lot.